Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. My name's Lucia France and this is the show where all of your property dilemmas are turned into solutions. Now joining me in the studio today we have our panel of experts starting with Stephen Galpin. So welcome to you Stephen. Hi. Stephen is a London-based property consultant. We also have Paul Mahoney. Welcome again, Paul, to you, Managing Director of Nova Financial Group, and Mike Gray as well, who is Managing Director of Deadman Gray Property Consultants. So welcome to you, Mike. So we'll get started with the first question to you then, Stephen. It's uh, short and sweet this time, but something we regularly talk about on the show. Um, I'm looking to invest in London soon. Do recommend waiting until after Brexit. Well, it's a very difficult one, and if we all knew the answer, we'd all be quite well off, I think. Mm -hmm. But um, I think, in essence, the market at the moment is a little bit flat, so possibly a good time to buy. I think most of the larger agents are suggesting that there'll be a bounce in 2020, once we know the effects of Brexit, for better or worse. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, in, in, in essence, there's no real harm in, in, in buying now. I don't see any, any purpose in waiting. I know that we had some press, um, Bank of England were thinking that possibly there's a 30% dip on its way in property values. I, th I, I think that's grossly ex exaggerated. I think if you buy in quality areas, as you should always do anyway, then you're not going to see anything like that if indeed there is a further dip. Mm. But so, no, I'd say get on with it. If, it. if it works for you, if it's the type of property that you want, if you're in a position to manage it properly and look after it properly, um, you've got the support of your local agents and the information that goes with that, then get on and do it. Now, obviously, this particular viewer is asking about London. How does that um, fare for the rest of the country without being London-centric here? Well, I think, I, I mean, I get that criticism weekly, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get you out of that. <laughs> oh, too London-centric. Look, the, 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 there's no question. I mean, at the, at the moment, if you look at the figures nationally, I mean, there's some quotations last week, saying that in the north of England, Midlands to the north, there's something like a 14% per annum increase in property values against four point something in, in London. That's all very well. I, I would just say from an investment point of view, we're a capital city here, and in a capital city, it almost works like an insurance policy. There's always going to be somebody around who will buy your property or rent your property. Right. And if you're, if you're in the investment business, then that's what you need to look at. If I can just add a little anecdote Please to do. that, because I agree with what Steve said. I think investing in property is about time in the market rather than time in the market. I so there's never that, yeah. really a bad time to buy. There's always political and economic blips, and there's yeah. always a reason if you're a very conservative person not to buy. But I come across far too many people who are, you know, older in age and have had a good money their whole life but haven't invested, and they end up with very little. Yeah. Whereas those that invest early... Um, in the right areas, you know, in, in areas with depth, and you know, London isn't the only area in the UK with depth, there are others, um, then you can't really go too far wrong, so long as you're confident in sustainable demand, regardless of the state of the economy. And any thoughts on the Brexit situation as well? I think Brexit is one of those. It's, yeah. you know, it's a political or economic dip, uh, blip. No one really knows what Brexit is yet. It could be positive, it could be negative. Yeah. Who knows? Or a combination you know, of the two. Or a combination yeah. of the two. You know, buy <laughs> in an area where, you're, where people are going to want to live based upon employment, facilities, amenities. People aren't just going to disappear because of Brexit. Yeah. So if you buy in those properties in those sorts of areas, you can be confident in doing okay. And if the market does dip, well, it dips. You can see it through. Okay, Paul, on to your first question for today, which is, I've taken out a buy-to-let mortgage for an auction property. Rather than just a lick of paint, I've decided to remodel it slightly. I don't know how long this will take, maybe three to four months. The buy-to-let mortgage I got was portable, so could I, when the refurb is complete, get rental and sale valuations or quotes and make a decision whether to rent or sell then? Or will I have done something wrong by having a buy-to-let mortgage but never actually renting it out? Please help, I'm confused. Okay. There's a few things to consider there. A buy-to-let mortgage is for the purpose of letting the property. So by taking that mortgage, you are essentially saying to the lender that you're going to let it, mm -hmm. because the reason they've given you that mortgage is they're comfortable with the rent the property is generating to actually service it. Yeah. Um, so, so you technically are doing something wrong by not letting it straight away. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you were going into getting the mortgage with that intent, then you, should have, you really should tell the lender that. And there are specific products available for that purpose. 
Um, some you lenders mean for the purpose of, not for the being purpose sure of which, renovating. Right, okay, yeah, some yeah. lenders might be okay with it on a buy to let basis, others won't. Okay. Um, you, you could go for bridging finance, which will be more expensive, but it is for the purpose of properties that aren't ready to let. Right, okay. Um, the other thing to consider is if you do that and you get away with it with your current lender and you're not either not tell them or tell them, um, and it gets to the point of wanting to perhaps remortgage or, or, or sell, you won't have any letting history. So right, they will yeah. ask to see the, the, sh the short, short tenancy agreements, the AST, mm -hmm. and, and see that it's been let. And if it hasn't, then they're going to want to know why. Right. And that could cause you issues. Um, so I, I'd say, depending on whether they've actually taken that mortgage yet or not, if that's their intention, mm -hmm. then just be honest about it. Um, get advice from an independent broker on, on what the most suitable product is for that purpose yeah. um, and, and go down that path. And where they say um, they are doing the refurb or, um, you know, slightly remodelling it, does that matter that they haven't told their lender about those refurbishments? Well, the, the, if, if it's not being let mm -hmm. and it is on a standard buy to let and the, the, the lender thinks there's a tenant in there, then, te then, then potentially, yes, that, right. could, that could cause a problem. Okay. Um, because, of course, you know, the way that lenders look at the serviceability of a buy to let mortgage is the rent that's going to service it. Yeah. Um, it's far less about the actual individual situation. Um, so that could cause them problems depending on the lender and the product they've gone for. And do you think that in this case, when they decide you know, to sell it, or if they decide to sell it, um, it would be worth changing the mortgage before that? Well, that's another thing to think about, is a buy-to-let mortgage is given on the purpose of being quite long-term. Mm. You know, usually it's at least a 10-year term. Now, if you're buying and selling properties all the time with buy-to-let mortgages, you'll, you'll soon get blacklisted by lenders yeah. because they aren't going into it for the purpose of lending to you for a year or two or six months. Mm. You know, that's what short-term finance is for. So if you're doing that all the time, you're going to, it's not going to go on for very long. Okay. Thank just, you very just, Sorry, just one, yeah, Just one question on, on thinking about that. On the, uh, uh, it's two types of lending, isn't it? The short-term and long-term. Mm. Uh, is there still on the buy to let mortgages? Would there still be redemption fees to pay if people pay that? There'd off be entry to... and exit fees. Fine, yeah. okay. So you yeah. pay arrangement fees, yeah. and you generally, depending on the mortgage um, and the the length of the initial term, pay an exit fee as well. Especially right. if it's fixed, it'd be a higher fee. But even when it's not fixed, usually there's a two or three year minimum term. Okay. Right, okay. So, yeah, it's kind of like you're going to get stung one way or another. Yeah, either before or at the end. That's right. it's probably not a very cost-effective way of doing it. No. Although yeah. the interest rate might be a bit lower, you might find that other types of finance might be more cost-effective in the long run. So basically just be upfront in the first place, yeah. really. Seek advice and do, yeah. you know, use the product that's fit for purpose. Absolutely. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, now moving on to you, Mike. This is your first question for today. Why do people sell at auction rather than with estate agents? I have a property, a two-bed semi-detached property in a 1930s development near a historic village. Properties in the village sell quickly all the time, but I'm not getting any interest in my home. Would putting it in an auction help me? Yeah, that's an interesting question as well. <clears throat> the, um, the thing about choosing, not, not every property is right for selling by auction. So, uh, and we often recommend that, uh, that a different route of sale should be taking place. But in the right situation for the right property, it really is the one that brings it to a head nice and quickly. Mm. Uh, the example you use there, uh, uh, it doesn't matter where it is, whether it's near a village or a town centre location or in a, you know, a vibrant city. Uh, very often it's the timing where somebody wants to get the result. Uh, years ago, uh, auction was always considered to be like the last resort or we've tried everything else, now what should we do? Right. But that's not the case now because there are more people, particularly in the investment market, that are now looking to buy through auction yeah. because it's, uh, it's, less, it's less troublesome, it's more instant and you can get a quicker decision. That means the buyers have got to, have got to be ready to go and the sellers then know that they can get an outcome within a six or eight week period. Yeah. So there's a bit of a balance. Uh, what we do is we look at two things. It's, it's the property that's being considered to be sold and also the situation of the seller. Mm. If they are living there themselves and they've still got somewhere to find, well, then auction's not the best route. But if it's already vacant, it might be divorce or it might have some financial pressure, well, then there's nothing better than a nice quick transaction yeah. over and done with within six weeks. 
And would you say here as well that, you know, she's um, this person, I'm not sure it's a male or female, is saying yeah. I'm not getting any interest in my home. Would yeah. you say that's something to do with, you yeah, know, maybe it's not on at the right price? Or? Well, it, it could always be price. Uh, it could be the way it's being marketed. Uh, there's different things, different ways in going about these things. The other thing that the, uh, the auction process uh, sort of delivers is a much bigger playing field and a much wider audience. Whereas sometimes when they're on the market, particularly this one where they're talking to a small village, mm. often the local agent may only reach out to a, a sort of smaller radius of potential buyers. Right. Whereas the auction market is a much bigger audience with probably uh, going out to people like not only investors, mm. buy to lets, people who want to live there themselves, property companies, landlords, uh, developers, and maybe somebody who wants to buy it up and extend it and invest some further money on it. So it's a much bigger, a bigger audience to reach out to for the purpose of selling. Mike, sorry, Mike, what's the, what's the difference in cost for going through an auction as opposed to an age? There's, there's, there's not too much difference. It probably generally works out just a little bit more expensive on the fee. It's still only a sale on, on uh, paid on results. So, so if it's not sold, the seller wouldn't pay any auction fees. The only, the only slight difference is there's an upfront entry fee which in, in regional positions is sort of between three and four hundred pounds right. and that's for preparing a catalogue and arranging the auction itself. So the fees don't vary too much but what it is it's more of a uh, it's, it's more of a direct commitment because yeah. the process is into auction a six or eight week marketing program you're on the rostrum and very often the deal is done within that period. And do you, do house you know do they normally sell that first auction that they've they've put on? Uh, it's with an auction. It is usually the first time round because the other thing, good auctioneers shouldn't be taking instructions on properties that either shouldn't be sold by auction or are in the right price level, because this really is a market to to bring it to a head. Mm. The the sort of statistics at the moment are one would expect between sort of sixty five and eighty five ninety percent success rate on all lots that are sold by auction. Great. OK, Mike, I'm going to have to leave that one there. Thank you, guys. That's all we have time for for this half. We'll see you back after the break. Welcome back to Property Question Time with me, Lucia France, and our panel of experts today, Stephen Galpin, Paul Mahoney and Mike Gray. So welcome back, guys. On to your next question, Stephen. I'm in an apartment block and my service charge has risen every year for the past four years. Is there anything I can do about this? Right, well that's not an easy one either, <laughs> is it? So, um, the answer is yes, there are, there are courses that you can take which, which may at least regulate your service charge. Um, particularly in, in an area like this, we're, we're, we're here in Docklands, you've got very complex buildings, high technology buildings, often with swimming pools, gymnasiums and multitude of facilities. And you must understand that if you buy in this type of building, it costs a lot of money to run. And, and of course, not all developers are as um, good perhaps as they should be. And you'll often find that a new development in its first years is subsidised to some degree by the developer while he's still there selling the remaining units etc and of course when he withdraws and goes you, you're, you're sort of on your own and I'm afraid swimming pools and gyms are not cheap to run yeah. so you've got to expect this and it's something that's very important I would suggest probably Paul will confirm this you know it, it, it's about affordability you've got to factor this into what you're buying whether it's for investment or whether it's your home now are there things that you can do about it well yes there are Usually you'll find in these buildings you'll have a residence association or a number of you that are perhaps a little bit more interested than others. Mm -hmm. And it's good to have that forum. I mean, the sort of things to look at, um, who's paying for the insurance on the building? Okay, well, if it's the developer, is he taking a commission from that? Nothing wrong with that as long as it's declared. But you might then want to say, well, look, I'm sorry, Mr. Developer, we want that to go out to tender. You must also find when, when developers suddenly come along and say, oh, well, the boilers are broken, we need some new boilers, and they're 200,000 apiece, so this is going to go on the service charge. 
make sure that you've received the correct notices for such works. You know, it's obligatory that a developer must give you, or a freeholder must give you, notice of those changes and demands. So it's all quite considered. There are tribunals that you can go to if you're unhappy about the progression of the service charge, usually upwards, very rarely downwards. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it can be done. It's a structured process, but it's a process that works. But, you know, common sense should prevail, like everything else, in any kind of dispute or misunderstanding or dissatisfaction with what you're doing. Try and talk to your freeholder, try and talk to the managing agents and see where it's going, see what the real causes are. And you'll probably understand why those increases are happening. And, and do you think this is a particularly unique case? This, this person is saying every year for the past four years? I no, mean, no, I don't. I think I could probably name you half a dozen buildings within a hundred <laughs> yards of here. Oh, that really? <laughs> the same, the same okay. thing's happened. So it's quite a common situation. It, it is, <laughs> and you should never underestimate. I mean, there are buildings here where perhaps a two-bedroom apartment will cost you in the region of 14,000, 15,000 a year in terms of service charge. It's a huge overhead, and as Paul will know, many people underestimate this. It eats into their investment value, and all of a sudden they have a shock about what they're actually realising on their very hefty investment. Yeah, yeah. any thoughts on that, Paul? Yeah, look, it will, it will also depend on the age of the building. Um, you know, generally you'll find they'll, they'll rise more as the building gets older because there's more to repair. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as Steve said, there definitely is a requirement for them to justify those costs. Um, uh, you know, I think generally people feel as though they're not justified, but y you can go through those processes to find out why, why there's these increases. Um, but yeah, you definitely need to account for it. Yeah, I think just sort of check and, you know, be, be one of those residents who does know what's going on, otherwise it could probably seem quite... Um, quite confusing. Great, thank you very much Stephen. Okay, Paul, your next question for today is this. I am moving abroad and trying to sell my flat, but with little luck. I was promised an easy sell by my estate agent, but not much happening after several weeks, having dro even dropped the price. My mum is in a position to buy the flat outright from me and then let it out. Is this a viable idea? Are there taxes, etc., that she or I need to be aware of? Would she need a mortgage? Thank you for any help or advice. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's a few things to consider. It's not an uncommon situation with a no. state agent signing <laughs> you up and then you know, show, promising the world and showing you the atlas. Um, but uh, so far as selling, t t did they say it was a buy-to-let property? Uh, they said that, it, I think they own it okay. and they're trying to, their, their mother is in a position to buy the flat outright okay. from them and then let it out. All right, so, so there, there would be taxes to pay. Um, in that essentially the, the, their mother is, does, isn't a linked entity to them in, in any way or in the eyes of HMRC. Yep. So they would have to sell it to their mother. Um, whether they did that at market rate or not, taxes would be levied at market rate. Right. Um, so if it's their home, they probably wouldn't pay capital gains tax. Um, if it's a buy to let, they would. Right. That would be either 18% or 28%, depending on the marginal tax rate. Um, the, the, their mother would pay um, stamp duty yep. um, and again that so would depend the, on the, the usual all the, all the usual expect. stuff it's like yep. selling to a complete stranger yeah um, did, did they ask about mortgages yeah would uh, they're saying would she need a mortgage but then previously to that they say uh, she's in a position to buy the flat outright from me and then well if she can out. buy it outright of course she wouldn't need a mortgage no. um, depending on what she's planning to use the property for, would really determine whether she should take a mortgage. You know, if she's buying it to live in it, then you're better off having a debt-free home. If she's buying it as a buy-to-let, I'd say she's probably better off having a mortgage. Well, that's, I think that's the idea here, buy it outright from me and then let it out. So, oh, right, yeah. OK, there we go. Yeah. Well, if she's buying as a buy-to-let, then yes, of course, you can buy a cash-bought buy-to-let, but this has come up quite a few times in other episodes where you know, I'm a, quite a strong believer that the major benefit of property investment is the mortgages. You know, the ability to leverage your funds yeah. uh, results in quite sh can result in quite strong returns on your cash or your equity whilst not necessarily having to set the world on fire on the asset returns. Okay. Um, so rather than the mother buying cash, she could take a mortgage and maybe buy a couple of properties right. um, and probably get a much better return on her funds. Great. Okay. Thank you very much there for that question, Paul. And then, Mike, on to your next question for today. Um, my company has outgrown its current leased office. There's a large commercial building for sale nearby, which is suitable, but too big. Could I buy it? 
and then split the property and sell the other half or would I have to rent it out? Any advice would be appreciated. Yep, that's a, that's a predicament that many businesses find when looking for additional space to grow their business. Uh, you can't always find the right space in the right location to suit their particular requirements. I think it's dangerous sometimes to buy something that's too large yeah. because they're then forcing extra pressure and finance on that business for space that they don't necessarily need for running the business. Yeah. But uh, asking their particular, answering their particular question, uh, of course they could either take on the extra space and arrange for a tenant to let the other, the other area, or of course they could break it off and sell that off mm -hmm. to, to keep their own finances intact. In uh, that of course depends on each property, whether it can split well, and whether the communal areas lead to the areas of the three potential tenants that might be there. Right. Uh, so that would need some careful thought. Uh, the other advantage by doing something like this is they're then taking on a larger building than they need, which may give them the chance for growing into that extra space in two or three years down the road. Yeah. So that would be very good, astute sort of planning for the future. Uh, I think the main thing to, to, to consider here for somebody is they shouldn't put extra financial pressure on a business taking on something too large, when actually their prime focus here is buying some space to operate their business from. So the moment they do that, they become half an occupier for their own business, and the rest of it is really considered as an investment. And yeah. Are they really in a position to be able to take on that investment as well as their own expansion? Well, it's interesting you say that because in the first sentence of this, it says um, the company has outgrown its current leased office, which yes. they obviously don't own anything no. to kind of... No. Take against that. So, would you would you recommend maybe continuing to lease somewhere else? Well, it's about the space requirement they need, mm. and of course the location. And I always say to businesses, are you doing this for the best of the business, or are you looking to invest in some property for some further income? Mm. And I think often the two things very much get muddled up. Yeah. And sometimes I think businesses have gone a little bit too far with the extra space. So, for focus one: is it the space they really need, and where is it? And if the only way they can do that to make that move is there's some extra accommodation they don't need, but for goodness sake, not these days, don't leave it vacant. Okay. There are tenancy options, there are breaking off and selling it. And don't forget nowadays, one last point, they can arrange for tenancies on one or two years on a shorter term. So don't commit it to too long because it's, uh, it's almost uh, a fact, isn't it? If they sublet it for three years, or five years, they'll need the space earlier themselves. Exactly. And they've lost the opportunity of having, to, having that chance. That's it. That's great. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mike. Thank you to all of our panellists today, Mike Gray, Paul Mahoney and Stephen Galpin. Thank you at home for watching. And if you would like to get in touch with us, then just go to the website property-tv.co.uk. Also on Instagram at property underscore TV and info at propertytelevision.tv if you'd like to email us. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you next time.